In the second half of the 20th century, Florence had beautiful and romantic places for lovers. Tuscany is known for rolling hills, and the hills around Florence are populated with small villages and winding country lanes, with little dirt roads every few hundred yards offering a quick pull off the road, a little place to park. One of these places is located just to the west of Florence, a town called Signa. Signa is about a 30-minute drive, but strategically located with isolated areas to park a car and gorgeous views. This town had always been strategic through the medieval periods, with its high-up castle built in 1000 AD. Now the barbarians weren't coming to conquer, but only on vacation, and so this area became better known as a type of lover's lane. In the 1960s, social norms in Italy around courting were loosening, and couples spent more time dating outside of strict family protocol. As most young people still lived at home, they needed to find a place to spend together far from prying eyes. If they had access to a car, this problem was solved. Saturday nights, and really any night they could be free, they could drive up the Florence Hills and spend a few hours together in the privacy of a parked car. Through the 60s and beyond, this was popular enough that the couples usually weren't alone. There would be cars popping up nearby, especially on a busy Saturday night, with maybe an occasional peeping Tom wandering by. This may sound too good to be true, and it is. We know that lovers' lanes over the years have been the protagonist of awful crimes, attracting the most evil people the ones that destroy love and happiness forever. This is the story of the monster of Florence. Hello and benvenuti to Italian True Crime. Today's story takes place in Tuscany. It was a Wednesday night, a warm, sultry evening in late August 1968. Barbara Locci was a young mother, 32 years old, with a six-year-old son. She was originally from Sardinia, so she was a bit of an outsider to Tuscany with its harsh dialect compared to her sing-song Sardo way of speaking and island attitude towards life. She was a free spirit and found life in Florence to be confining. That evening, she was hoping for a bit of midweek fun, something different and out of the ordinary. Her son, Natalino, was asleep in the back seat. She didn't have anyone to watch him, and so had no choice but to bring him along on this adventure. Driving the car was 29-year-old Antonio Lobianco. Antonio was a bricklayer and was originally from Sicily. He had moved up to Tuscany with his family for work over a decade earlier. The trio, Antonio, Barbara, and little Natalino, had all gone to the movie theater that evening, a date night including the young boy. When they piled into Antonio's giardinetta, this historical Alfa Romeo headed along the Via Castelletti taking the group to a relatively isolated area where they turned off the asphalt onto a dirt road and shortly thereafter parked. They arrived at the spot somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes after midnight. It was a new moon, and so the darkness was greater than usual. The couple began to get intimate in the front seat, while little Natalino was asleep in the back seat, we hope. At 2 a.m., in a house a little over two kilometers further down the dirt road, A man named Francesco de Felice was under protest, having been woken up by his young son in the middle of the night. His little boy was thirsty and had been asking his father for a glass of water. What a surprise when he then heard the doorbell ring at this hour. In his later testimony, he claimed he knew for sure it was exactly 2 a.m. As he thought it so strange that someone would ring his doorbell in the middle of the night, he made sure to double-check the time. He leaned out the window to see a little boy on the doorstep. He remembered the little boy saying, Open the door, I'm tired, my father is sick in bed, and my mother and uncle are dead in the car. Obviously, Francesco let little Natalino in the house. He thought it must have been a car accident. Once the boy was in the house, however, he couldn't see any marks on him, no evidence of an accident. He asked Natalino to try and explain what had happened. Natalino said, It was dark, all the plants were moving, nobody was there, I was so scared. To give me courage, I said my prayers. I began to sing the Tramontana. My mother died. My uncle died too. Father is at home sick. De Felice then asked him, Where is your mother? Why is she dead? And Natalino answered that his mother was in the car with his uncle near the cemetery. De Felice tried to reassure the boy that his mother and uncle were probably just sleeping, but Natalino was sure. He said he took his mother's hand. She's really dead. Francesco, together with a neighbor, went first to the Carabinieri, and together they found the car parked over two kilometers down the main road. The car had its turn indicator still on. Here they found Barbara and Antonio, both slumped in the front seat with four gunshot wounds each and five cartridge casings from a twenty-two caliber long rifle Barretta found at the crime scene, all with the letter H printed on the shell back. 
Antonio, the quote-unquote uncle, was a married man with three children. His wife was likewise from Sicily, and together they had three young children. He had met Barbara that summer, only a few weeks earlier, and she quickly added this young mason worker to her roster of lovers. Barbara was married to Stefano Mele, also from Sardinia, but almost 20 years older. Barbara had married Stefano when she was young and under pressure from her family. By 32, she was bored with her much older husband and had taken many boyfriends, or uncles, that she met in the area. Everyone in town knew this, so much so that she had the nickname Ape Regina, meaning Queen Bee. It didn't take long for suspicion to fall on her husband Stefano. At first, Stefano denied any involvement, and then he went so far as to accuse two other boyfriends of Barbara's, Salvatore and Francesco Vinci, who coincidentally were brothers and originally from Sardinia as well. When gunshot residue was found on Stefano's hands, evidence he had recently fired a gun, he confessed. He said he followed her on her date into the woods where he shot his wife and her lover shortly after they began to get intimate. He then threw the gun into a ditch. He knew things that the police hadn't made public, like the number of bullets fired. However, other things about the murder confused him, like the position from where he would have shot his gun into the car and through the window. He also didn't seem to know how to handle a gun. But on the other hand, he had confessed and had a very strong motive. This wouldn't be the first time a jealous husband murdered his wife and her lover. When the police interviewed the son Natalino, they really wanted to know how this little six-year-old walked barefoot over two kilometers in the dark and found the only home nearby. At first, the boy said he ran because he was scared, and then he just found the house. This is possible. If his mother was shot at about 30 minutes after midnight, he would have 90 minutes to walk to find the house, which at 2 kilometers and 300 meters down the road would take an adult about 30 minutes. He was barefoot and little and scared, but still this seemed doubtful to the police as he was just so young. Under continued questioning, he told them two versions, that either his father or his uncle had carried him to the house and left him there. He had only one father, Stefano, but all of his mother's lovers he called uncle. He said that either his father or uncle actually rang the doorbell for him and then left the scene, waiting long enough to make sure someone at the house came to the door. The police seemed to prefer this version, and for a while it was widely assumed that Stefano killed the lovers and then lovingly carried his son to the nearest house to get help. He wanted to make sure his son was okay, but if he took his son back home with him that night, the murder would be more easily traced back to him. Later, Natalino would recant this version and say that he really did run to the house all by himself, that he was under a lot of stress and trauma when being questioned. Stefano Mele was brought to trial and was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to 14 years. It was a reduced sentence as the judge found him incapable of fully understanding his actions. During the trial, the victim Antonio's brother-in-law spoke. He worked with Stefano and was also one of Barbara's lovers. He testified that a few days before the murder, Barbara confided in him that someone was following her on a moped. Another of Barbara's lovers, Francesco Vinci, who had been falsely accused by Stefano at one point and who was one of three brothers, all of whom were Barbara's lovers, he testified similarly, that Barbara confided in him someone was following her on a moped. Stefano Mele remained in jail and everyone seemed satisfied they had caught the right person. And for six years, the Florence Hills were safe for lovers. Until, that is, September 14th, 1974. Saturday night and a young couple, this time younger, 18 and 19, Stefania Pettini and Pasquale Gentilcore, they had met two years earlier at La Spiaggia, a discotheque, and had been boyfriend and girlfriend ever since. That night, September 14th, Pasquale first accompanied his little sister to a teen night at a discotheque at 9 p.m. He then went to pick up Stefania at her home for their date night and together left the house at 9.15. Pasquale's car, a Fiat 127, was seen by witnesses at a train crossing shortly after. Pasquale and Stefania were driving towards an isolated spot where they could park. They were on an asphalt road that connected two small towns right outside of Borgo San Lorenzo, where they then turned off onto a dirt road. The next day at 8.30 a.m., a local farmer came across a gruesome scene. Pasquale was leaning up against the driver's side window, wearing only his underwear and a watch. He had been shot five times in the back. According to the autopsy, he was killed instantly. The passenger seat was fully reclined, and according to investigators, Pasquale had been on top of Stefania at the time of the shots, both lying down. Stefania had been shot as well three times, but she had only been wounded. She probably tried to run from her killer. He dragged her outside the vehicle and proceeded to stab her over 90 times, mostly superficial and in the area of the stomach and the abdomen. Finally, police found her with a vine inserted into her vagina, which had been done after she was already dead. 
the killer returned to stab an already dead Pasquale a total of five times in the liver area. Stefania was left, laying lifeless behind the car on the ground. The killer left the passenger door open and the radio was still playing the next day when the farmer found this beautiful young couple so brutally murdered. In the investigation of the surrounding crime scene, five bullet casings, Winchester H-series, shot from a 22 caliber Beretta long rifle, were found. Though identical to the casings in the matching gun from the murders of six years prior, it would take a few more years until the cases were linked. For those of you paying attention, Stefano Mele, convicted of the 1968 murders, was in prison at the time of 1974, and therefore could not possibly have murdered Stefania and Pasquale. At this point, the known peeping toms of the area were rounded up and questioned. Several potential suspects were initially accused. First, there was 28-year-old local Giuseppe Francini. He confessed to murdering the couple early on in the investigation. Police looked into him and searched his home, but absolutely nothing tied him to the scene. It was deemed he was looking for attention and notoriety. Then there was father and husband, Guido Giovannini, who witnesses had identified spy-on couples in the very area on the night of the murder. This again was a dead end, as were the other peeping toms they investigated. The murder in 1968 didn't scare people around Florence, as it looked to be a domestic situation. The case of a jealous husband was good for gossip, but didn't make anyone concerned for their own personal safety. Whereas now, there was absolutely no one that would have had a reason to murder these two nice young teenagers, nor any known jealousy. It seemed to the people around Florence as the work of a madman, and that madman was still out there. Time passed without incident, and the Fiorentini started to forget, thinking it must have been a one-off. Until seven years later. On June 6, 1981, another Saturday night and an engaged couple, 30-year-old Giovanni Foggi and 21-year-old Carmela Di Nuccio, were out looking for a quiet place to be together. Giovanni worked for NL, the Italian power company, and Carmela worked for a leather goods producer. Despite only knowing each other a few months, they were ready to get married. Carmela lived in Scandici, a town bordering with Signa, the site of the 1968 murders, and very close to Florence. The couple had been to dinner at Carmela's home with her parents, and at 10 p.m. went for a walk, and took Giovanni's car for a drive. They drove further up the hill, overlooking Florence, finding an olive grove, to pull into and park. This was an area of Scandici known as Rovetta, and relatively busy on a Saturday night with both lovers and voyeurs. The following morning, an off-duty police officer out for an early morning walk discovered a gruesome scene. Giovanni was found shot dead in the driver's seat, with his head leaning against the window. Carmela's naked body was found outside the car, stabbed and mutilated. Her pubic area was completely removed by someone who had used a notched blade. Investigators said it could be a scuba knife. The killer must have taken her vagina with him as it was nowhere to be found. The entire scene was eerily similar to the scene seven years prior, even down to the female victim's purse found a few hundred yards from the scene with everything dumped out but nothing missing. The most compelling link would be the Winchester Bullet Casings H-Series from a 22 caliber Beretta Long Rifle. These two were found at the scene, just as in 1968 and 1974. Before too much was thought of the link, police investigated this as an individual murder. First, they looked closely at Carmela's ex-boyfriend. There was bad blood between the two. Lucky for him, he had a solid alibi. Almost immediately after the murder was discovered by the police, Vincenzo Spalletti was bragging in town about seeing two dead lovers. Vincenzo drove the local ambulance and in his spare time was a well-known peeping Tom. Police arrested him, not because they really thought he was the killer, but they thought he could have good information. Vincenzo was still in jail in October when they really did have to let him out. Another murder had taken place, and so it couldn't be Vincenzo. Only four months later, October 22, 1981, 26-year-old Stefano Baldi and his 24-year-old fiancée, Susanna Cambi, made a spontaneous decision to find a quiet area to park and be together, in an isolated area between Prato and Florence. They were going to be married soon, and though Stefano was supposed to have watched a football match with his friends that evening, he skipped those plans to spend a few hours in his VW Golf with his fiancée, Susanna. When their bodies were found in the morning, Stefano had been shot four times and Susanna five. Seven of the nine bullet casings were found and told a story of the same gun used as in 1968, 1974, and a few months earlier in June. Susanna additionally had four stab wounds and her genital area had been mutilated and removed again. This time there was finally a piece of new evidence. A shoe print was found, a size 44, and a military-style shoe. Like the previous cases, the victim's purse was found nearby with all her belongings scattered. Unlike the other killings, both victims' bodies were found outside of the car. Finally, the police spoke to the public. 
Florence was world-renowned for art and culture. How would they communicate to the people of Florence, of Italy, and the world that there was something far worse than a peeping Tom harassing couples? There was a serial killer on the loose, and for the rest of the 1980s, Florence would be terrified. The journalist Mario Spezzi, an author of one of the best books about this case, would give the name Il Mostro di Firenze to Italy's first known serial killer, the Monster of Florence. Antonella Migliorini was 19 years old and working at a candy company. She and her boyfriend, 22-year-old mechanic Paolo Mainardi, had been together for some time and were by now engaged to be married. Friends and family called them Vinaville, a brand of superglue, because they were always stuck together. Like other couples in love, they liked to enjoy the intimacy of the Florence area's Lover Lane parked car on a Saturday night. But with this maniac on the loose, it was too much for Antonella. She told her friends she was too scared, and though Paolo was probably disappointed, he agreed with the concern. Well, they must have been desperate that Saturday night, June 19, 1982, when the couple parked Paolo Seat in an isolated area near the village of Monte Spertoli, where they both lived. Montespertoli was found past Scandici and Signa, which were both closer to Firenze. Montespertoli was more rural and isolated. Here the killer found them and shot several times hitting Paolo. According to reconstructions of the crime scene, Paolo must have managed to get the car going and in gear enough to reverse out into the main road, but sadly from there getting stuck in a ditch. The killer had shot out the headlights and then shot into the car, killing Antonella. The interior light was switched on, and now the car was also on a bigger road, so at this point the killer must have been scared he would be found out, and he left without mutilating Antonella. When police arrived on the scene, they found Paolo still alive and had an ambulance rush him to the hospital. He never regained consciousness and died shortly after. As it had already been reported to the media that Paolo had been found alive, the police decided to leak the news that before he died he was able to give them some important details about the murderer. They hoped this would cause the killer to panic and make a mistake. It worked. A few days after Paolo's funeral, the paramedic who tended to him at the scene received a phone call in the middle of the night. The caller asked him what Paolo had said. The paramedic was confused and asked who the person was. I'm the monster of Florence, the caller said. The same caller managed to track down the paramedic when he was away on vacation. Police wondered how the monster was able to find out the exact identity of the paramedic who had been in the ambulance with Paolo and would even know he was on vacation. The plan had worked and they had gotten the monster's attention, but police were not able to trace the calls and all they could do was to wait for him to strike again. The false leak did spark an anonymous letter signed by Il Cittadino Amico, meaning the concerned citizen. The letter claimed that the same gun was used in the 1968 murder of Barbara Locci and Antonio Lobianco in an attempt to make sure the police were including that double homicide in their investigations. Police ran ballistic tests and confirmed that the anonymous letter writer was correct. This did point to one and the same killer. The gun had a defective firing pin that left a distinct mark on the bullets. There was no doubt that the bullets had been fired by the same gun. A ballistics check proved that the same gun, a Beretta 22 caliber long rifle, had been used with the same Winchester bullets. It was simply a matter of finding the gun would mean finding the killer. But 14 years had passed and they still didn't have the gun. Now that investigators had confirmed the same gun was used in the double homicides of 1968, 1974, two in 1981, and 1982, you may be asking, what about poor Stefano Mele, still in prison for the 1968 murder of his wife? He obviously couldn't have been the killer for the subsequent murders. Prosecutors wanted to hold on to this lead. They believed he had committed the murder of his wife, and then before he was arrested, he had given his gun to a trusted family member or friend, and this gun somehow came to be in the hands of the killer of the next four double murders. Stefano had, in the meantime, changed his story several times. Now he accused Francesco Vinci of having committed the murders. Francesco had been one of the initial suspects, and now he did look more promising than Stefano, as he hadn't been in prison for most of the monster's murders. They arrested Francesco in August 1982, but that didn't mean they released Stefano. They kept him in prison, sure he was still involved. The Florentine police had made announcements to the public, but that was for a local or regional Italian-speaking public getting news from local media, from newspapers, and local news on television. Florence and the rest of Italy, however, had a much bigger population, one that would expand in the summer months. When the tourists come, they don't often watch local news stations on TV nor read the local paper, and they probably only have a rudimentary level of Italian at best. The news of the monster of Florence at this time hadn't reached too far out of the Tuscan countryside. Mostly the local authorities didn't want to deter the lucrative tourism market, and maybe they figured tourists wouldn't have need of the lover's lane and so wouldn't be affected by the madman loose in the hills. 
In early September 1983, two 24-year-old German college students were making their way through Italy in a Volkswagen Samba bus. Though this location wasn't their first choice to park, as it was later reported they had already been asked to leave one area, it looked like they had finally found a nice place to park the bus and stay for the night. What better place than the beautiful hills near Florence? On September 9, 1983, more than a year after the murders of Paolo Mainardi and Antonella Migliorini, the bodies of German students Horst Meyer and Uwe Rusch were found murdered in their bus. They had been shot through the window. The VW bus was higher than the vehicles in previous murders, and this allowed crime scene technicians to determine that the shooter was about 5 foot 11 or 1.8 meters tall. However, no other signature rituals had been performed. Police theorized that the killer had mistaken the petite Horst, who had shoulder-length blonde and curly hair, for a woman. When the killer realized his victims were both male, he was angry and left the scene without performing his rituals and mutilations. People became increasingly terrified as panic swept across the city of Florence. Authorities and others urged young couples to take care and not to go to isolated spots outside of the city. They used the slogan, Occhio ragazzi! meaning watch out, guys, urging couples not to visit secluded spots in the countryside surrounding Florence. A special task force was established, Squadra Antimostro, colloquially known as SAM. Police appealed to the public for helping in identifying the monster, offering a large reward for information leading to the capture of the killer. Police were inundated by phone calls and letters. Wives were suspecting their husbands, neighbors pointing fingers at each other. Even priests were suspected. And heaven forbid you were a tall male. They all seemed to be suspects in the eyes of the public. Now also prosecutors were looking at the fact that they now had had two accused men in jail at the time of these latest murders. They released and exonerated Francesco Vinci, who they had more recently accused, but they still kept Stefano in jail. Stefano kept changing his story and now included accusations of his own brother, Giovanni Mele, and his brother-in-law, Piero Mucciarini. These two were formally accused and sent to jail, where after eight months they would be released. Not because of a great alibi or forensic evidence to exonerate them. No, they were released because the killer struck again. On July 29, 1984, 21-year-old student Claudio Stefanacci and 18-year-old bartender Piero Antini were shot and stabbed in Claudio's Fiat Panda around 9.45 p.m. Claudio was killed instantly, but Pia had tried to escape. The killer shot Pia in the back a few more times, and then when he tried to finish her off, he mutilated her. He removed her pubic area, and this time he didn't stop with that gruesome act. This time he also removed her left breast. Pia's mother had begun to worry early, as her daughter had promised to be back within an hour. Pia had said she was tired from working extra shifts at the bar, and she just wanted a quick outing with her boyfriend. Her mother knew something was wrong and searched out Pia's friends who knew exactly where to go and find their friend, who apparently would go to the same parking spot every time with her boyfriend. Police were looking for a 5'11 man with a size 44 shoe. If he stuck to his pattern, it would be some time before he struck again. The police didn't need more time. What they needed was information to catch him before he had any more victims. In September 1985, a French couple, 25-year-old musician Jean-Michel and Nadine Mohio, a 36-year-old businesswoman, were visiting Italy in a camper van. On the evening of September 7th, the couple set up camp for the night in a wooded area near San Cascino. Evidence showed that the attacker slashed the tent with his knife first, probably hoping they would get out of the tent to investigate, which they did. He first shot Nadine in the face, killing her instantly. Jean-Michel only received a shot in the wrist and made a run for the woods. He was an amateur sprinter and had a good chance of making an escape. However, his killer caught up with him, shot him again, and slashed his throat. The cut was so deep, Jean-Michel was almost decapitated. Like the other female victims, Nadine's pubic area was mutilated. He also took off her left breast, as in the case of Pierontini. The French couple's bodies remained undiscovered and no missing persons report was made because they were tourists and their families did not realize they had met with foul play. The killer must have become frustrated that this crime scene wasn't being discovered. He sent a taunting note along with Nadine's breast to state prosecutor Silvia de la Monica. He said that there was another murder and he challenged law enforcement to find the bodies. As Sylvia was the only female officer in the investigation, it seemed that the killer knew exactly who to send it to, to create the most impact. This incident rattled Sylvia so much, it led to her retirement from law enforcement soon after. The letter was composed using cutout letters from a magazine like an old-school criminal. A spelling mistake, however, gave further insight into the killer. He may be uneducated, or Italian was not his first language. 
There were now eight double homicides, 16 people killed. Finally, the killing stopped. No similar murders were ever committed in the Florence area again. Investigators looked back at the characteristics of each crime scene to look for anything that matched up. As you may have noticed, there were so many similarities allowing the investigators to match up more than just the gun. For example, the killer, if possible, dragged the female bodies a distance away from the vehicle. This showed he most likely worked alone. It may also signify his power over females. The couples were usually killed where they were in the act of making love, and most of the murders occurred on moonless summer or early autumn nights, usually on a Saturday night. Many profiles were made of the monster. Even the FBI became involved at this point. For the most part, the profiles determined that he was most likely a solitary man with no significant relationships in his life, and he did not have a stable job. He was likely impotent because, even though the crimes were sexual in nature, he never committed sexual acts. The way in which the pubic areas were removed showed that the perpetrator had knowledge about incision, so maybe a gynecologist, a surgeon, or a butcher, perhaps. He probably chose his victims more on location and opportunity. He would be familiar with the area and choose spots he knew well. At this point, the police were still no closer to assuring the public they knew who the monster was. They still had Stefan Omele in jail, but they were beginning to think maybe he was innocent. He himself was proclaiming his innocence from his prison cell, and for now, accusing half of Sardinia. In fact, this would be known as the Sardinia Trail, which had more twists and turns than the winding country roads around Tuscany. This insane rabbit hole would consume prosecutors and lead to one resignation and absolutely no convictions. Stefano eventually died of a heart attack in 1995 while at a halfway house after having been moved there from prison due to his poor health. These murders occurred at a time when serial killers could operate with more freedom as separate police departments had less ability to communicate. With advances in technology, new leads emerged. In the early 1990s, centralized data collection and analysis was taking off. Police investigating the Florence serial killer could scan databases of sex crime offenders and cross-check with deaths or incarceration. There was a man on this list who had also been identified in one of the many anonymous calls, Pietro Pacciani. He had raped his daughters and was jailed between 1974 and 1981, the exact period in which the monster did not commit any murders. He was simply a really bad person. In 1951, he was convicted of the murder of a man who had slept with his girlfriend. He followed his wife and her lover into the woods and waited until they were in the middle of making love. With a nearby rock, he knocked the man out cold and then stabbed him even though the blow from the rock had already killed him. He sexually assaulted his girlfriend next to her dead lover's body. When they were done, he took the man's wallet as a final disrespect. Pietro told police it had happened spontaneously, that seeing his girlfriend's naked body with another man made him enraged. He remembered seeing her left breast against the man's chest. Could this have been why he cut off Pia and Nadine's breasts? In town, he was known as Il Fuoco, or the fire, because in his younger years, he worked as a fire eater at the carnival. He was known to be a peeping Tom, a compulsive liar, and a swindler. And Pietro was not only violent, but also cruel. To save money, he fed his wife and daughter's dog food, according to testimony from them. But in contrast to his violent and cruel nature, he enjoyed creating art and poetry. Police saw this as proof he was capable of carefully planning his murders and would include what he saw as artistic rituals and considered his mutilations a work of art. The only physical evidence against Pachani was an unfired twenty two caliber bullet found in his garden. The bullet was the same brand the monster Florence used, but as it had not been fired, they could not tell if it was ever in the monster's Beretta. Pietro lived in the vicinity of the murders, and his car fitted the description of multiple eyewitnesses who reported seeing such a car near the crime scenes around the time of the murders. When Pietro's trial began on January 19, 1993, he pleaded not guilty. He claimed that the bullet was placed in his garden by police in an attempt to frame him. A contentious part of this case was that of the French tourists and the uncertainty about the time of their deaths. It was ruled they were killed on the Sunday night. But because of their stomach contents, a rabbit pasta they had at a restaurant on Saturday night, it was more likely that the killing occurred on Saturday. However, Pietro had a solid alibi for Saturday. He had been at a fair and many witnesses had seen him there all night. In November 1994, Pietro Pacciani was convicted of killing seven of the eight couples. Two years later, however, his conviction was overturned and a new trial ordered. He was acquitted because the judge said the physical evidence against him was not strong enough. The judge agreed that the evidence could have been planted. Profilers and psychologists felt very strongly about the fact that the monster of Florence was impotent, yet Pietro didn't seem to have problems with this at all. In fact, according to others, he had the exact opposite problem. 
Additionally, none of the crime scenes showed any signs of robbery, but Pietro was known to never miss an opportunity to cheat anyone out of money. He was also overweight, and it didn't seem likely he could catch up with the athletic 25-year-old Jean-Michel when he ran away. Most compelling, however, was Pietro's height. After all this, he was only 5'2", but there was strong evidence to suggest the killer was closer to 5'11". Pietro died days before his second trial began and never had the chance to be fully acquitted. As they did with Stefano Mele, police did not want to let go of this suspect. They began to investigate the possibility that the murders were performed by a group and Pietro was the leader. So began the chapter of the investigation known as Compagni di Merenda, or Snack Friends, or Picnic Companions. Pietro was found to have two picnic companions that police alleged were accomplices. All through the trial, the defense was that these were not close friends, but picnic companions, lightening up the trial atmosphere of an otherwise tense courtroom. One of the picnic friends confessed and was sentenced to life in prison, but this was based solely on his confession. His testimony did not fit any of the evidence. When the public looked just a tiny bit into his confession and who he was, they were pretty sure he was both looking for attention and looking to prison as a step-up relative to his current life situation. He was an out-of-work alcoholic vagrant. It seemed like a great opportunity to him. His other picnic friend also confessed eventually and was likewise convicted. Now, according to police in the courts, the killers had been found, and they were the picnic friends. Many people continued to think that the police were mistaken about the picnic companions and considered the case to be unsolved. The issue of the gun had not been seriously addressed. The shootings were performed with precision by someone who knew what they were doing. According to one of the defense lawyers, the monster was most likely a police officer who used his position of authority when he approached the couple. His theory was based on the fact that, at many of the scenes, vehicle registration was found at the feet of the driver, suggesting they had taken it out and shown it shortly before they were killed. Eyewitnesses also mentioned a police car with a solar officer patrolling the area on the nights of the murders, something that was never done as the police always patrolled in pairs. This would also explain about the possible evidence tampering. On the other hand, the fact that the killer called the paramedic to find out what Paolo had said before he died would seem to point away from a police officer, though the calls may have been made just for that very reason, to make sure no one connected the killer with the police force. One person to whom none of this made sense was Mario Spezzi, mentioned earlier as the journalist that named the killer the Monster of Florence. Mario became obsessed with this case and used that obsession to write the definitive book about the murders. He became concerned that these two in jail were not only wrongly convicted, but this meant there was no more investigation and the real killer was possibly still out there and capable of striking a ninth time. Mario was more to the belief that an early suspect never fully developed needed to be more fully investigated. Salvatore Vinci was the first lover Barbara took when she moved to Tuscany from Sardinia. Salvatore was a boarder at her home with her husband Stefano and she took a quick liking to him. It has even been rumored that little Natalino is Salvatore's son and not Stefano. When Salvatore introduced her to his brother Francesco, she dumped Salvatore and took up with his brother. She then dumped the brother and took up with Antonio the Sicilian. This angered the Vinci brothers. Barbara had also been stealing money from her husband, and one line of reasoning is that the Vinci brothers attempted to make amends with Stefano and the Mele family by promising to get the money back from Barbara. So up on the hill that night was the husband Stefano and the two jilted lovers. Stefano would have fired at least once as he had the gun residue on his hands, but seeing as how he really was a simpleton and could barely handle a gun, it was thought more likely Salvatore that did all of the murdering. Evidence had also come up that the gun most likely had been purchased by Salvatore in Sardinia many years prior and he had brought it with him to Tuscany. Stefano claimed he took the fall because he was being blackmailed by Salvatore and that's why he hadn't mentioned him earlier. There is additional evidence against Salvatore. In one of the transcripts of Little Natalino's telling of what happened that night in 1968, he doesn't just mention an uncle, but says Zio Salvatore. According to this argument, following the 1968 murders, Salvatore kept the firearm at his home. In 1974, he reported a robbery. His son Antonio, 15 at the time, had stolen items from the home. Salvatore had never said the gun was stolen, but then again, he never would have admitted to having this particular gun involved in a crime. Antonio and Salvatore didn't have a normal father-son relationship, and Antonio had had a rough childhood, being pawned off with different people and never having a stable home. By 15, Antonio was known to be a troublemaker, and he was often in trouble with the police. At one point in his teenage years, he threatened his father, Salvatore, with a scuba knife. Shortly after he robbed his father, where the Beretta was being held, the killings of Pasquale and Stefania took place. 
Then Antonio was sent to live with family in Sardinia, where he stayed from 1974 to 1981, when he then returned to Tuscany and right before the monster began to kill again. According to those who follow this line of reasoning, Antonio is most likely impotent and has had problems with women because of this. He's never had children and his first wife divorced him, citing the inability to procreate. The investigation revealed a dark side of Florence that had remained hidden behind its artistic and picturesque surface. It exposed a disturbing realm of deviance, brutality, envy, blackmail, and arcane customs. The great mystery was that nobody could determine what motivated the monster's homicides. His actions were deliberate and premeditated. As of now, a sense of ambiguity lingers over the matter, leaving us to wonder whether the Mons Florence will ever be apprehended and face trial. Thank you for listening to Italian True Crime, the English language podcast for Italophiles. Today's case has been widely covered in the international media, and there are great resources to dive further into the details. Mario Spezzi's book, which he wrote together with Douglas Preston, is available in English and is a fantastic deep dive. Mario was so involved with this case that the police started to investigate him as the monster, and they even arrested him for obstruction of justice. A truly crazy twist, proof that there is never a dull moment in Italian crime and events.